Tuesday arrived, and the family was again at the dinner table. Justin finished the last of his second plate of spaghetti. Michelle questioned Paul about some invoices for the last load of crab he sold. David rocked in his chair, nodding his hair at the base of his skull. Justin pushed his plate away and reached for his glass of wine. We've been chit-chatting about the plan all week. Now is the time for a yes or no. He settled back in his chair and took a deep breath. We have to be together on this thing. A divided decision is unthinkable. He paused, looking at each of his children in turn. If the vote is a tie, I'll give myself a double vote. David looked at Michelle. I see no reason not to prepare. In fact, it would be a mistake if we didn't. I also think it's important to keep it all quiet. Paul nodded his head in agreement. I agree with it all. Michelle's eyes shifted from one brother to the other. What about our friends? What about our relatives? Don't we tell them? Don't we say something? She turned to Justin, and her eyes widened. What about Zoe? Justin's shoulders slumped noticeably. Zoe's in New York. I haven't heard anything from her. He turned to Michelle. No, we don't tell anyone. The world situation is obvious. Preparation is a choice. All suddenly went quiet. Justin rubbed his chin. There are a lot of people preparing, but not all. He took a deep breath and shook his head and let the words spill across the table. I don't want us to be in the situation where those who didn't prepare attempt... He left his sentence hanging. Well, you know what I mean. Michelle put her hands to her cheeks. I hate this. I really hate it. But yes... I agree. She spun her head toward Justin. When will we have to leave? All eyes shifted to Justin. We'll know when the time comes. For the next half hour, Justin added a few details to the plan and then gave them their assignments. The children listened to their father without interruption. When he finished, they rose silently, cleared the table, and departed to different parts of the house. Justin remained at the table, sipping wine in quiet repose. In this unfamiliar situation, they proceeded slowly. Each task started as a group effort, but ended with an individual. They spent hours with maps that led to expeditions to affirm choices. Simultaneously, they prepared their bodies, with medical examinations, dental care, and physical training that emphasized endurance, such as running in the sand dunes. They expected the wilderness lifestyle of itself to give them the strength they needed. They experimented with shoes and clothing, read books, watched videos, and talked to people seeking survival skills. Supply choices demanded extensive scrutiny. With added consideration for needs after the calamity, a mammoth list resulted. However, time ironed out the problems. They stored the supplies in aluminum chests and buried three at eight different locations, one on top of the other. The top chest buried two feet down, measured four feet by three feet by three feet. Fifty percent of its space consisted of food, ten percent for medical supplies, and forty percent for clothing. Below that chest lay a shovel, an axe, a rope, and a light cable, all wrapped in oiled canvas. The second chest, two feet further down, measured eight feet by four feet by four feet. Thirty percent of its space consisted of food, mostly dried, including vitamins, minerals, and seed for a garden. Another ten percent went to medical supplies, including surgical equipment and information on its use. The remaining space was for clothing. An inventory of tools and weapons, also wrapped in oilskin, lay beneath this second chest. The last chest, allocated to recovery time, 
measured six feet by two feet by four feet. It contained material related to the arts and sciences. It was a noble effort, but the collection, though far from complete, instilled hope for the future. Into the unused nooks and crannies of every chest they stuffed all sorts of items, mostly personal and impulsively chosen. The weapons of choice consisted of compound bows, blow guns, and knives. Firearms and ammunition, heavy in most cases, required constant care. Any repair work seemed difficult, and procurement of additional ammunition unlikely. Their noisy quality was counter to the plan of avoiding detection. They situated all of the supply sites away from the coast as a precaution against tidal waves. Establishing them on hilltops deterred visits and reduced their loss from landslides or covering debris. They placed multiple markers, large and durable, at the burial sites and others in a circle five miles from the area. Pointing them in random directions made them meaningless to all except the family. The project was exhausting, expensive, time-consuming, and vital. All members of the family memorized the location of each cache, and every chest contained a coded map of all the chests. Pencils, pens, and paper were added with the thought that if the family got separated, a message could be left. They trained with their weapons, practiced hunting techniques, built shelters, and learned different ways to make fire. They studied emergency first aid, minor surgery, and combat medicine. They acquired knowledge of edible plants, including mushrooms, animals, and insects. They learned where to look for water and how to purify it. At their home in Winchester Bay, departure supplies and equipment sat ready. A four-wheel drive vehicle stood by to deliver them to a predetermined place for entry into the wilderness. The family never strayed more than twenty miles from one another, and all members knew the location of the others at all times. Keeping their plans to themselves required intensive effort, not only because of the practical problems involved, but the emotional ones as well. The family lived in this area for close to twenty years, and the children had friendships going back to grammar school, pals, confidants, and partners in mischief, people from the joyous times of growing up, people they would leave without a word. Justin's worldly notions came to pass. The world's situation deteriorated. The family's departure into the wilderness was imminent. With plans perceived as both justifiable and plausible, they retreated into isolation. Chapter 3 Dwindling Serenity Nicole The Cessna 150 swooped in a low pass over the Circle 11 ranch. The pilot, Teddy Stanick, sat next to his wife, Maya. Nicole and her husband, Adam, sat behind them. The plane's maneuver informed Adam and Nicole's daughters, Julia and Shemaine, of their parents' return from Seattle. The ranch sat in the northeast corner of Washington State. It was a sprawling, prosperous ranch that Adam's ancestors pioneered over 150 years ago. With succeeding generations, acreage was added and improvements made to both equipment and stock. The well-organized ranch, part green rolling hills dotted white with grazing sheep, and part flat land roamed by huge red cattle, was profitable and a model to similar establishments in the area. Forested hills greened the northeast corner of the ranch. Pristine in tone and appearance, the area supplied timber to the modest sawmill at the ranch. The plane banked to the left, two hundred feet above the ranch house. Nicole elbowed Adam. Look, the girls. Two waving figures ran from the house 
as the plane completed a half circle and leveled off. The girls dashed to a truck parked near an old apple tree. Adam tapped Nicole's knee. Ten bucks Julia gets to the driver's seat first. Nicole smirked. She's already at the door. Nicole studied the land passing beneath the aircraft, her first sky view at springtime. An enchanting sight of pink blooming fruit trees and yellow spotted pastures. Nicole touched Adam's knee. Everything is so lush, she pointed. The sheep are little balls of cotton in the high grass. Adam squeezed her hand. I'm happy that you're happy living here. Nicole started life as a city girl in Seattle and later lived in San Francisco. For her, the ranch had a fascination tinged with adventure. Nicole turned, her eyes narrowed with a smile. I loved San Francisco and teaching, and of course the opportunity to dance. But here, she turned back to the window, I've found something special. She spun toward Adam. A home. Adam squeezed her hand. Nicole sat back and closed her eyes. The airy sensation of dance swirled through her mind. She missed the bodily movement. However, her dance play with her daughter Shemaine softened the loss. Nicole took a deep breath. I love flying. The plane, now level, flew to the south. Teddy turned to Adam. Same spot, Adam? Yep, it's been mowed and the windsock is up. Adam and Nicole had taken the train to Seattle to see Nicole's parents and spend a few days with the Stanics. An impulsive decision, it broke the routine of ranch life. Once again the plane banked to the left as it descended behind a low hill to a newly mowed pasture. Teddy pushed in the throttle and nosed the plane into a sharper descent. The aircraft made a comfortable touchdown, came to a stop, and Teddy silenced the engine with a flip of a switch. Sorry we can't stay, but Maya doesn't like flying at night. Nicole undid her seat belt. The kids will be disappointed. I'm sure they were expecting a flight. Maya opened the passenger door, climbed out, and turned to Nicole. Tell them I'll give them an extra special ride next time. After unloading the luggage, they exchanged goodbye hugs. The Stanics climbed back into the plane, Maya the pilot. The engine started after a quick spin of the propeller, and the aircraft rolled a short way, turned a sharp 180 degrees, and headed back to the sky. Nicole and Adam watched the plane lift into the air. Nicole squeezed Adam's hand. That was fun, and I got to see my parents. They turned to the clamor of a speeding truck billowing a cloud of dust. Adam chuckled. <laughs> They're going to be pissed. The truck slid to a stop. Shemaine jumped from the passenger side. She slammed the door. Julia drives like a jerk. Her eyes squinted. Sixty on a dirt road. Adam and Nicole walked to the road. Shemaine, seventeen, the oldest of the two daughters, pointed to her sister. Her driving is a hazard. She won't listen no matter what I say. Like Julia, she had her mother's black hair, which they both wore long. Shemaine's whipped through the air as she spun toward her sister, still sitting in the truck. You're not driving back. Julia was fifteen, smaller than her sister, but a good athlete with surprising strength. She loved horses and played the flute. You're my sister, not my mother. A sarcastic smile came to her face. Julia scooted across the seat, opened the door, and dropped down in front of her sister. You're such an old lady. There's no traffic around here. Adam hoisted the luggage into the back of the truck. Sixty miles per hour on this road is too fast. If nothing else, it's very hard on the truck. Julia hugged her mother. Why did they leave so fast? I thought we were going to get a ride. Nicole pushed her back to arm's length. Oh, d did you want a ride? I didn't think of it. She turned to Adam. Did you know they wanted a ride in the airplane? No, I didn't. He looked at Julia with a puzzled look on his face. Did you want a ride in the airplane? 
Julia stepped to her father, planting a kiss on his cheek. Very funny. Chimane, still sulking, quietly kissed her parents and immediately climbed into the driver's side of the truck. The truck was the ranch worker with the crew cab. Nicole and Adam got into the back seats, and the family headed for the house. Nicole put a hand on Adam's knee as she studied her daughters. They would soon be going to college, and after that, seeking a life of their own. Nicole remembered her parents' sadness when she told them of her plans to move to San Francisco. Mom, Dad, it's what I want. I'll be teaching at Brentwood Academy, and I'll have a chance to audition. Teaching was rewarding beyond her expectations. With an active social life, her situation became most comfortable. She even spent an entire summer touring the nation with a small dance troupe. However, her stay in San Francisco lasted only a few years. Chimane shouted, Look who's coming! A large liver-and-white Appaloosa stallion pranced a fast trot toward the truck. He was Adam's horse, and at over twenty years of age was seldom ridden. Adam showed his face, and the horse whinnied, nodded, and snorted with obvious glee. The truck slowed, and Adam rolled down his window. "'Hi, big fella. I'll get you some apples later.' Nicole leaned forward to see the horse. Named Prepared, Nicole had seen the animal for the first time in a San Francisco horse show. Shortly after that, she had her first sight of Adam. The horse show occurred in the winter following her summer dance tour. Nicole attended at the invitation of her friend Heather, a fellow teacher. After the show's conclusion, the ladies proceeded to the stables seeking a closer look at the animals. Nicole wore cream-colored slacks, loose about her legs, but clinging to her hips. Her blouse, white with an open collar, showed a V of powder-white skin between her very ample breasts. Being sleeveless, it exposed arms of real strength. Her hair, long and black, framed her cool blue eyes. Definitely overdressed for the stables, she had watched the show from the table section, sipping wine coolers. The visit to the stable was unexpected. They paused to pat the head of a huge Persian draft horse. Nicole spun to her right with a sudden sensation of someone standing next to her. With no one there, she followed the feeling to a man fifty feet away. He stood by a horse Nicole recognized from the show. His back to her, he tinkered with horse equipment. Nicole liked what she saw and what she felt. Nicole maneuvered herself and Heather to within fifteen feet of Adam. Adam looked over his shoulder at the sound of their voices. Nicole pondered his shiny black eyes as he smiled and spoke into his horse's ear. Now there's a pretty lady. He continued to look at Nicole with a grin that flashed above a strong chin and under a thick blonde mustache. Their subsequent romance flowed like skiing in powder, fast, soft, and lots of fun. Quick to be lovers, they married after a short ten months and headed north. Prepared, whinnied, and halted. Adam shut his window, and the truck drove on. He spoke to the girls. We've got presents for you guys, but most of the things are being shipped. He squeezed Nicole's knee. Your mother is ferocious when she shops, and she knows Seattle like the back of her hand. Julia spun around to face her mother. Tell us what you get. Nicole smiled. Later. After dinner. Shemaine spoke over her shoulder. At dinner, please. Adam inquired. Were there any calls from the Cattlemen's Association? Adam spent a great deal of time with ranch business, a diligence that related more to a sense of duty than desire. It reflected a peculiar side to his personality, a type of paranoia. To be more exact, a fear of unpreparedness. The notion was strong, although not debilitating. Nicole and the children considered it more amusing than serious. They thought it a result of his parents' early death, caused by a sudden storm on Mount Hood, where they were caught and died of exposure. They were unprepared. On the premises of the ranch, 
Adam did his best to prevent that type of scenario from occurring again. He stored extra food, medical supplies, and ammunition. He even built a bomb shelter, installed an auxiliary power generator, acquired two four-wheel drive vehicles, and cut four different departure routes through the brush, one to the north, one to the south, and two others leading east and west. Adam instructed Nicole and his daughters in the use of all the equipment and its location. He had only a bit of success in getting them to read the survival books that he put about the ranch house. The man's insistence with these precautions was at times difficult. However, the women indulged him. They couldn't resist his sincerity and open concern for their well-being. Shemaine answered his question. All the messages are written down. The truck arrived at the ranch house, and the entire family went in to enjoy the meal the girls had prepared. Life at the ranch remained agreeable and very comfortable, even in a world of troublesome happenings. On a bright, sunny summer day, Adam called Nicole from the nearby town of Kettle Falls. Hi, sugar. I just bought a new pickup. It's a big sucker. Four-wheel drive, diesel-powered, extra fuel tanks. You're going to love it. Nicole grinned and nodded. Another truck. I'm sure I'll love it. I already love the other two. Adam chuckled. Well, you know. Keep the kids close. I want to show it to them. Let them drive it. Will do, love. Okay, later. Nicole folded the phone and put it in her pocket. In a loud voice, she called, Julia! Julia was saddling her horse, Buttons, at the far end of the barn. Buttons was a big, fast, and agile animal. Nicole worried when Adam suggested giving him to her, knowing her daughter's aggressive nature. However, Adam's wisdom held the day. It's better she have a horse with the ability to match her nerve than one she might push too far. Julia hollered, Almost finished. What's up? Your father's bringing home a new truck. He wants you and your sister to stick around until he gets here. Julia rode out of the stall and walked the horse up to Nicole. She looked down at her mother. Mom, please. I know how to drive a truck. Shift gears, four-wheel drive, all that stuff. No need to go through it again. Yes, again. Go find your sister and tell her to stay nearby. I don't know what to do with all the keys I have now. She kneed her horse slightly. Come on, Buttons. The horse carried her out of the barn at a slow walk as the girl continued talking. Keys for the trucks. Keys for the house. Keys for the shelter. Keys for the generator. My friends come over and ask me, What's with all the keys? And I... She turned left as she exited the barn, and the sound of her chatter ceased. An hour and a half later, Adam drove up with the new truck, got out, and walked to the women standing at the barn door. Shemaine slapped her thighs with both hands. Dad, it's another truck. We know about trucks. Adam waved his right hand. This won't take long. He bent slightly toward Shemaine. I do this because I love you and care about you. He took them to the truck and showed them this and that, and then gave them all keys. Next, the girls were obliged to drive the truck into the corral, put it in four-wheel drive, and run it back. Julia, without an invitation, climbed into the truck, drove into the corral, shifted into four-wheel drive, and cut the wheel hard and stomped on the accelerator. The truck did a donut, and she sped back to the barn. Julia jumped out, a big smile on her face. Shemaine walked over to Julia and snatched the keys out of her hands. Ass! When will you grow up? Shemaine drove with deliberate calm. Back at the barn, the girls disappeared in an instant. Nicole ambled over to Adam and gave him a big hug. Maybe we should have a tank on hand. She paused. I know what we need, a balloon. We could just float off, just in case all of the trucks don't run. Adam hugged her back. 
I'd love to float off with you. He kissed her on the top of the head as they walked into the barn. I know I'm overprotective, but I read the paper and I get scared silly. I feel helpless, so I buy a truck. You need a distraction. Nicole stood on her toes and kissed him. You scared off the kids. They won't be back for hours, and... She pointed her thumb toward the barn's hayloft. There's fresh hay up there. Adam's foresight would prove life-saving for the family, but naive in development. Adam's preparations were known by all the locals, including the unprepared and the unscrupulous. The times pulsed with strangeness and trepidation. Chapter 4 The Crumbling The prophets of old predicted the end of this age would be preceded by the appearance of many fiery objects in the sky, and so it came to be. From the cosmos, streaking comets and meteors adorned the night sky, beautiful and jewel-like. But for many, this was a terrifying beauty. Within religious groups, people hung their heads in submissive dread. Others, more optimistic and convinced of their purity, looked skyward, anticipating deliverance through ascension. Public penance became commonplace, and many of the rich surrendered their wealth. Spiritual fanaticism flared, stimulated by prophecy, spectacle, and proclamations of heavenly visitations. At the other end of the spectrum, inner fear of impending doom fostered the extremes of murder and suicide. Among the flamboyant and frivolous, sky-watching became the vogue. Commercial aircraft, refitted with special viewing ports, ferried the rich to high-altitude viewing of the cosmic extravaganza. Books and songs dramatized the events. Clothing and fashion designers, makers of movies and toys, all found inspiration in the celestial show. The scientific world, entirely enraptured, fired rockets to sample the wakes of the interstellar objects. Data-fed computers hummed and produced information faster than it could be read. On Earth, the long-occurring and gradual phenomena of global warming suddenly surged. The band of heat normal to equatorial Earth expanded north and south into the major food-producing temperate zones. The sterilizing effect of the winter freeze was compromised. Crops endured assaults of insect blooms and disease infestations. Food became the major issue when humanity experienced its first worldwide crop failure. The majority of cultivated food plants of similar hybrid types lacked diversity, which amplified worldwide vulnerability. Starvation touched every continent. The earth's hot places blistered and cracked in the increasing heat. From within, it rumbled and groaned with terrifying frequency. In California, a long series of closely spaced moderate quakes reduced most major cities to piles of rubble. The state's man-made dams crumbled and released rivers that rampaged through towns and cities. Unchallenged fires raged, fed by broken fuel lines and spewing oil wells. The wild lands of brush and forest burned. Of the heroic and desperate who ventured into the smoke and rubble, few returned. California was not alone in the devastation. Similar disasters occurred worldwide. Large cities suffered the most. Panic and confusion raged. Hospitals ceased functioning, and the sick had to fend for themselves. Law enforcement dissipated into self-defense. Collapse. Collapse collapse. When the rains did fall, they were ponderous. Rivers broadened, lakes expanded to seas, and the polar ice shrunk. In Antarctica, a large portion of the western ice slope slid into the sea. Ocean levels rose dramatically, evoking coastal flooding. Collapse. 
collapse, collapse. Chapter 5 Shadow Places Justin As California rumbled, its population scattered, many people arriving in Oregon. At first, Oregonians took the refugees to heart, providing them with what they could. However, as in the town of Winchester Bay, most places soon posted signs indicating the town could hold no more. Charitable efforts vanished. Those with supplies became defensive, and those without, aggressive. Federal officials conducted self-indulgent preparations, and all agencies discontinued contact with the populace. Politicians disappeared into military compounds, which they sealed with zealous security. Departure time for Justin and his family arrived. Hostilities erupted throughout the area, and the periodic sound of shots crackled in the air. In early fall, the northwest anguished under persistent drought, and the forest dried to kindling. Justin apprehensively studied the sky for signs of rain. However, a greater danger loomed in the eyes of neighboring people. He knew they would fight to live, and he wanted no part of that struggle. The family sat at home, waiting for the night and the rising of the moon. They dealt with their fears and sadness, and many silent tears fell in the gloom of their awareness. At midnight, Justin rose to his feet. Let's go. They walked out the door to their waiting vehicle. They got in and Justin started the engine. I'm going to make a quick stop at the sea view. He stared through the windshield. One more look at the sea and a goodbye. It'll only take a moment. He took their silence as an affirmative answer. A short five-minute drive brought them to an overlook a hundred and fifty feet above a sandy beach. Justin and Paul got out of the car. The moon glittered the sea with silver sparks. The air was still, cool, and moist with the breath of the sea. Justin's chest expanded and contracted in three deep breaths. Perfumed femininity. He turned to Paul. It'll be a long time before we see her again. Paul shuffled his feet on sand-dusted stone and reached down to pinch a small measure of white granules between his forefinger and thumb. Part of the sand he placed in his trouser pocket. The rest he handed to his father. I think of the orca sitting and waiting for an ugly end. That hurts. He strolled back to the car. Justin gazed across the sea and whispered, Forget me not. He then turned in the direction of the moored orca. Sorry, gal. He looked to the east. Take care, Zoe. Looking at the sand in his hand, he let it drop to the ground. Not so very far at sea, a whale's head rose above the shimmering waves and looked toward land. The creature held the position for a very long moment and then slid slowly beneath the surface. Justin returned to the car, started the engine, and the family headed inland. They left their home, they left the sea, and focused on the future, a future sure to have pain and struggle and sure to not leave them unmarked. They drove through Winchester Bay, watching shadowy figures move among the unlit buildings. The four-wheeler never stopped. David stared through the back window until a turn in the road blotted out the view of the little town. Michelle never looked back. She leaned her head against the side window in quiet repose. They came to and turned down a gravel road that headed east into the dense Oregon coastal forest. When they reached their pre-selected spot, they parked the truck and covered it with brush. Justin turned to the direction from which they came. He toyed with the keys. Perhaps a miracle. He put the keys into his pocket. With packs loaded, 
the foursome disappeared into the thick, dark forest. Chapter 6 Fearful, Bedeviled, Nicole Adam's diagnosed paranoia transformed into insight. The locals now praised him, and a few apologized for past criticisms. You did the right thing, Adam. Should have done the same thing myself. However, the congratulations dwindled with the dwindling of supplies accessible to the populace. The local attitude toward Adam and his family changed to an inquiring nature. Tell me, Adam, just how much food and stuff do you have on hand? Adam... Are you willing to share your supplies? Adam sat in his favorite living room chair. Nicole lay across from him on a plush, deep red couch. Her eyes studied the heavy beams of the high-arched ceiling. The room was large and old and little changed from generations back. Nicole's left arm cushioned the back of her head. Her right arm caressed a hollow and nervous stomach. Adam rubbed his chin as he stared down at the plush Asiatic rug. Everybody around here knows I've got piles of supplies. He looked at Nicole. I've been talking about it for years. He shook his head. I've even tried to get the others to do the same. Nicole swung her feet to the floor and leaned forward. Her hands went to the sides of her head and her long black hair draped over the rug. So you think there's going to be trouble? Adam slumped down in his chair. His head eased back and he closed his eyes. The stuff we have. Social order is breaking down. His head moved like a ponderous weight and he rubbed his eyes. Trouble is on the way. After a long silence, Adam spoke again. Envision a mass of people. Our neighbors? In desperate need. Marching on our home? He took a deep breath. It's a matter of time. They will soon need things. We can't stop them. He looked deeply into Nicole's eyes. We wouldn't want to. Nicole sat back into the couch, her body weak from continued stress. Perhaps we can give it away now, before anything happens. Adam stood up and strode to the large stone fireplace. There was no fire. It was late spring. He extended his palms to the mantel and leaned his weight against the stones. Who gets what? And how much? In the end, they'll take it all. How can we survive with nothing? Nicole spoke to his back. Are you saying that we have to leave? Adam's head dropped between his arms. There's no other way. Two days later, a very demoralized family gathered in the living room, the girls on the couch, Nicole in Adam's chair, and Adam standing in front of the fireplace. They sat before him, quiet and solemnly attentive. Adam proceeded. I made a mistake. I don't know why I didn't anticipate it. He looked up and shook his head. Most of the people around here are totally unprepared. They're running out of everything and they know we have a lot of what they need. Nicole sat quietly, her chin resting on entwined fingers. Shemaine watched her father with puffy eyes as she wrung a wad of tissues in her hands. Julia curled up at the other end of the couch and pulled an afghan across her body. The girls now spent these days at home avoiding the neighbors and the townspeople. Adam continued, I was in town yesterday. There isn't much left in any of the stores. Shemaine spoke in a shaky voice. Why don't we give some of our stuff away? Nicole turned solemn eyes to her daughter. They'll keep coming until everything is gone. She paused. We don't want to get involved in any sort of confrontation. Adam took a deep breath. No, no, we can't fight. We have to take what we can and go somewhere. Julia's eyes brightened. Maybe we can go to Grandma and Grandpa's in Seattle? Adam shook his head. No. 
No, maybe later when things simmer down. He looked at Nicole and turned back to the children. Things in the city are probably worse. Nicole's voice cracked as she spoke. We spoke to Grandma and Grandpa. They told us to stay away. She couldn't say any more. She couldn't tell the girls that her parents' phone only beeped a busy signal for the past week. She closed her eyes with a silent sigh. Shemaine spoke in a whisper. Her words quivered. Well, I guess we can go somewhere for a while. Wait things out? Come back later? Adam straightened and spoke with firm words. Right. We'll take the two big trucks, load them up with supplies, and find a spot to hunker down for a while. We'll camp somewhere. Shemaine forced a smile. When do we go? What do we bring? Adam moved to his daughters and stood before them. We'll take it one step at a time. First step, I'll turn all the livestock loose. He looked at Nicole. Your mother will start gathering the camping stuff and food. And you two, he looked at Julia, go upstairs and get your camping clothes together. Julia uncurled and stood. Shemaine rose, walked past her father, and stood at her sister's side. Adam sighed. Do it now. The girls turned with heads down and walked out of the room and up the stairs. Adam turned to Nicole. We'll set up a campsite down the south road, near Chippy Creek. I can make a few runs back to get more stuff. He exhaled a deep breath. Then we'll decide on step two. Nicole's eyes welled with tears. She blinked and the tears rolled down her cheeks. She took a deep breath and looked at Adam. The good times are over, aren't they? Adam didn't answer. In the silence they could hear the girls moving about and talking through their tears. Adam whispered, I'm going out to the barn. They established the campsite at Chippy Creek. Nicole and the girls stayed at the site, and Adam made trips back to the ranch for additional supplies. The truck's AM-FM radios kept them up to date on world events, which continued to deteriorate, panic spreading, cities in riots, and the roads filled with the fleeing. Their cell phones still worked and provided communications. Calls to their neighbors gave the impression that the situation at the ranch remained unchanged. To add to the deception, Adam drove through town several times. Adam finished unloading the truck after his fifth trip to the ranch. Nicole wrung her hands. That should be enough. She looked at the pile. It's more than we can take with us, even with two trucks. She waited for Adam to answer. Then she pleaded. Let's cover our trail. On to step two. Adam kicked a few stones in the dusty soil. I want to make one more trip, a few more medical supplies. He looked at her. We can hide some of this stuff and get it later. Adam, we have enough. Nicole's hands started to shake and she clasped them together. It'll be okay. I'll call you on the phone before I go in. Adam's eyes shifted away. We need a reserve. He shrugged his shoulders. Just in case. Adam walked to the truck and climbed in. I'll look the place over with the field glasses. If anything is amiss, I'm out of there. I don't like this, Adam. Please, please stay. It's okay. One more trip. His hand reached for the ignition key and the truck's engine roared to life. Nicole stepped back. She unclasped her hands and whispered as the truck rumbled away. It'll be okay. The truck went over a little rise and was gone. Nicole continued to watch for several long moments. She took a deep breath, turned, and took long strides to the other truck to await his call. About forty minutes later, the phone rang. Nicole picked it up and pushed the appropriate buttons. Hi. 
It's quiet. I'm going in. This won't take long. Leave the phone on. Okay. The engine rumbled as Adam drove to a storage building. She heard the truck door open and close. Later, she heard sounds of things dropping into the back of the truck. That's enough, Adam. That's enough. Minutes later, the cab door opened, and she heard sounds of Adam climbing in. The truck door shut, but almost instantly reopened, and a powerful blast sounded. Nicole flinched and sucked in a breath. Terror rose from her bottom, passed through her heart, and filled her mind. What the fuck? You asshole! You killed the sucker! A husky voice, a voice Nicole knew. A matching facial image flashed in her mind. Rufus Dawn, the owner of a dilapidated ranch close to town. Nicole's legs trembled. The phone spoke with a younger voice. What'd you want to do? Take prisoners? Nicole's quivering hand rose to her mouth. Rufus spoke again. He was taking that shit somewhere. He came from down that road. Again, the younger voice. Hey, is that cell phone on? Shit. The phone went silent. Nicole swallowed. The phone fell from her grip and her vision blurred. On trembling legs, she exited the truck, her hands groping across the truck's front fender. She blinked to clear the blurring in her eyes and scanned the campsite. A large pile of equipment, Two tents and a smoldering fire sat near the shallow stream. Shemaine sat with her back toward Nicole, her legs drawn up tight under her chest, held by her arms. Her chin rested on her knees as she gazed at the stream. Julia stood at her sister's side, facing her mother. The young girl's hand reached out and shook Shemaine's shoulder. Nicole squinted at a strange droning sound that blocked out all other sound. Her hands shook and her stomach hollowed. Her gaze turned to the stack of supplies. Her mind whispered, The killers will follow the road to this place. You have to do something. The children. The children. She looked at them. Shemaine rose and turned to face her. Her mouth moved, but the words were inaudible to Nicole. The girls started walking toward her, grimacing. Their strides queerly labored. Nicole ran to the supplies and shouted hysterically, Load the truck! Hurry as much as we can! Hurry! The girls came to a sudden stop and gawked at their mother. Nicole picked up a box and shouted, Do what I said! The girls didn't respond. Nicole dropped the box and rushed to them. She grabbed each by the hand and dragged them to the supplies. Pick something up and put it in the truck! Nicole picked up a box and threw it in the truck. The girls responded with ugly scowls and barraged Nicole with questions, questions that fell on deaf ears. Nicole spun around, her eyes glaring. Do it! Do it now! The girls responded and tried to match their mother's speed. They filled the truck and covered the contents with a tent. Nicole directed the girls into the cab. She climbed in behind the steering wheel and gave the ignition switch a quick twist. The big engine roared with power that restored Nicole's hearing. The girls were again jabbering for an explanation. Nicole raised her hand to silence them. Tears welled and ran down her cheeks. Her voice stammered. Your, your father is dead. Someone shot him. Her hands gripped the top of the steering wheel, and she rested her head on her knuckles. I heard the whole thing on the phone. She took two short breaths. They know we're here. Our supplies. They're coming to get them. She rolled her head toward them. We have to run. Her hands trembled. Shemaine's eyes widened, and she shouted, What? Nicole ignored the question pushed herself back into the seat, shifted the transmission lever into drive, and depressed the accelerator. The truck's back tire sprayed gravel and proceeded down the bumpy, primitive road. Nicole acted with pure instinct. Step two presented itself as going.
simply going. The world was now a jungle, and they were pursued by predatory animals. They could hide in the jungle, but they couldn't get out of it. Nicole drove with sporadic shivers, the sound of the shot echoing in her mind. My lover is gone. His strength is gone. We're alone. Julia sat next to her, rocking back and forth, her hands covering her face. Shemaine's hands moved in a silent one-person conversation. Nicole hung on to the steering wheel, eyeing the darkening shroud of a day's end. I don't want the night. She looked in the rearview mirror. We're alone. The primitive back road ended, and a paved one began. Intuitively, Nicole turned to the southerly direction. No sleep needed. She drove on and on. Periodically, the girls talked to each other in short conversations. At other times, one or the other cried. Questions directed at Nicole were answered by the phrase, I don't know. Silence enveloped the trio. Droning hours gave way to a new day. Nicole stared through weighty eyes and slouched behind the wheel. Exhaustion provided a near vacant mind, and the sun's light bestowed a touch of warmth. The girls, awake, stared hypnotically, their eyes merely slits. Nicole slowed down and turned left at an intersection. She didn't know why, she just did it. The road separated two fields of knee-high, brown, dry grass. The matching images enveloped her scattered mind with simplicity. Three miles down the road, to her left, a group of bushy trees stood like a bundle of green umbrellas. Nicole slowed the truck, shifted into four-wheel drive, and turned into the surprisingly smooth field. She drove to the trees, stopped, and silenced the truck. Nicole slumped across the steering wheel with her head turned toward the girls. Get the sleeping bags. She blinked. Find a place under the trees. I'll sleep in the truck. Julia and Shemaine listlessly climbed out of the truck, and when they returned, Nicole lay across the seat, asleep. They covered her and withdrew to the trees. Hours later, Nicole, startled by a dream, sat up. Still dreamy, she fumbled to open the door. Slowly, she stepped to the ground and walked to the rear of the truck. With her bladder in urgent pain, she dropped her trousers and squatted with a relaxed sigh. Wheel tracks led back to the road. Nicole mused. A trail. The killers. They'll find us. Jerking up her jeans... She rushed to the spot where the truck left the road. Sure of imminent danger, she panicked and attempted to make the trodden grass stand. Again and again she tried, only to yield to exhaustion and frustration. Teary-eyed, she crumbled to the ground. Adam's gone. Adam's gone. Adam's gone. She lay there for close to an hour. Without the imposing thought of her children, she would have stayed there. Instead, she struggled to her feet. Her fingers brushed sweat from her eyes, and her lungs sucked in a weak breath. On languid legs, she followed the twin trails back to the truck. Halfway there, Nicole knelt, gasping with stomach pains and a pulsing pressure in her skull that fluttered her eyes. The golden grass turned a shiny red. She slumped to the ground and rolled to her back. The new position calmed her. Moments later, she opened her eyes to the thump of feet. The concerned faces of Shemaine and Julia stared down at her. Julia held her interlaced fingers beneath her chin, as if in a prayer. Are you okay? Nicole extended a hand to Shemaine, who pulled her to her feet. I'll be okay. She looked around, trying to remember where she was. We should eat something, keep our strength up. All three ambled back to the truck.
The next few days dribbled by slowly. With little enthusiasm, the family set up their tent and arranged their food and water. The shock of their situation surged in waves of panic, provoking bouts of crying. Their sleep was intermittent and always restless. Days passed. The panic eased into lethargic depression and long periods of empty sleep. Conversations were short. Food was consumed in tiny bits. A week passed. In the early light of a new day, Nicole strode to the back of the truck, nibbling on a dry cracker. She stopped and turned in the direction of the road. A vision of its firm blackness extending afar stimulated a curious desire, and she made slow steps toward it. The flattened grass had regained some of its height, and she tore at the tops. For the first time since the shooting, she functioned without pain. A comfortable sensation, but empty. Near the road a bird whistled and a breeze rustled the grass. Nicole's eyes shifted to a drone-like sound that came from her left. A bee, maybe a fly. She looked for the insect, but only tiny white butterflies fluttered above the grass. The noise persisted and grew undeniably louder. Suddenly alerted, Nicole's body stiffened, her dreamy mind cleared, and she instinctively crouched, her fingertips touching the ground. People were coming. Nicole dropped flat to the ground. She never saw the vehicle. She just heard the Doppler effect of its coming and going. She closed her eyes with relief. <sighs> Still safe. She lay there, the left side of her face cushioned comfortably on the top of her right hand. Her black shirt absorbed the rays of the sun, relaxing tense muscles. She studied the miniature forest of leafless trees and a black ant that scurried among them. It zigzagged across the top of her left hand and fled back to the grass foliage. Feeling colossal, she pondered the plight of the insect. So many ways to die. I might even kill it myself. Maybe when I walk back to the truck. Nicole rolled to warm her chest. But that's your life, she exhaled a breath, and you will live it. Nicole rose into a cooling breeze that swirled about her torso. The smoky veil of confusion that came with Adam's death evaporated. She blinked in acknowledgment. What are we doing? Her mind immediately clicked off the factors of their situation. Nicole got to her feet and stood quietly listening for the bee sounds. There were none. With long strides and swinging arms, she headed back to the truck and her moping children. Halfway there, she yelled, Julia, start unloading the truck. She cupped her hands over her mouth. Shemaine, you help her. We need to know what we have. The girls turned to her shouting, but stood quietly gawking. Nicole went to the cab, found a pen and paper, and returned to her daughters. Call out each item you unload. The girls didn't move. Let's go, girls. It's time to get our shit together. Shemaine leaned on the truck's tailgate. Why? Nicole hesitated only a moment. Because we are alive. She walked past Shemaine stopped, and turned to face her. Let's go. Start unloading. Shemaine smirked, spun around, and grabbed the tent covering the supplies. With a yank, she tore it from the truck. She hefted a box. Dried food, noodles, and vegetables. Nicole wrote it down. They had plenty of food, ample medical supplies, including stores of vitamins. They had enough weapons to equip all, including the needed ammunition, four boxes of extra clothing, and most importantly, manuals on survival. They found a few tools, an axe, a small shovel, and some rope. Their complement of items showed a good balance. Shemaine leaned on the truck. 
We don't have much water left. Nicole looked at her. True. Shemaine spoke in a monotone. We have to find some. Nicole's face was deadpan. You have something to think about. Nicole estimated their fuel at nearly a hundred gallons of diesel, enough to travel many miles and many miles more if they kept their speed down. Nicole smiled at the girls. We've got lots of fuel, and perhaps we can find more. She walked to the cab. Put everything back in the truck. She paused and turned. Put the guns in the cab, with some ammunition. Julius slumped against the truck. What are we doing? Are we going somewhere? Nicole answered without looking at her. Yes, we're going somewhere. We're definitely not going to sit here. She turned to Shemaine. No water, right? Shemaine looked at her feet. We need a river, a stream. Right, and we'll find one. Julia picked up a box of trapping devices. Maybe a well? Nicole smiled. Maybe. We'll go south, and we'll think about things as we go. Nicole reached into the cab and popped the hood latch. At the front of the truck, she raised the hood. Her eyes scanned the engine compartment. Oil, transmission fluid, water. She put her hands on her hips. No law and three women traveling alone with a truckload of goodies. She pulled the oil dipstick from its tube. Trusting anybody will be foolish. We have to be careful. Even if we meet someone we know. Everything looked fine, and she shut the hood. The girls were talking at the back of the truck. Julia handed a box to her sister. Yeah, I think it's time we get out of here. Shemaine put the box in the bed and gave it a shove. It won't matter what we do. Nicole stepped forward. It matters. We have a chance. Things will get better. We'll find a place and we'll stay out of the way. We're strong and we have supplies. And we have weapons. She sat on the tailgate. Come on, guys. The good days are gone, but some day the bad days will be gone. Her eyes brightened and she shook her head. We'll go on. She jumped from the tailgate and went to the pile of supplies and opened a box. Here. She waved a book in the air. How to catch small game and cook in the wild. She picked up another. And this one, battlefield first aid. And this one, shelter in the wilderness. We have what we need except a place to hide. Her smile faded. Remember, whoever doesn't try will be a burden to the rest. Her eyes darted from one girl to the other. Do you understand? Shemaine shouted, No, I don't understand. I don't understand anything. Julia repeated the statement. Mom, I don't really understand either. Nicole's face clouded. Then don't understand and just do as you're told. Shemaine expelled a long breath. Where are we going? Nicole threw the books back into the box. We'll head south toward northern Nevada. Your father's cousins live there. She gripped her stomach with one hand. They came to visit us years ago. You two were very young at the time. Julia toyed with a length of string. Are things okay there? Nicole expelled a breath and put her hands on her hips. I don't know what their situation is, but it's a place to go. Shemaine turned to her sister. It may be worse there. Nicole made no reply, just walked away and leaned against the front fender. A few moments later, Julia headed for the trees, dragging her sleeping bag. Nicole closed her eyes. We have to be prepared to defend ourselves. She let the words sink in. Even if it means shooting someone... Julia froze in mid-stride. Shooting someone? She started to walk again. Now I have to shoot someone. She flapped the sleeping bag. The good days are gone. No shit. She turned and again headed for the trees, mumbling all the way. Shemaine put her hands on her hips. Shoot someone. Shoot someone. Sure. Why not? Nicole, satisfied that the thought was planted, opened the door of the truck 
and climbed in. The next day, a bright and sunny day, they got into the truck, drove back to the road, and turned, following its southerly path. Near noon, from the other direction, a sedan approached. The distance between the two vehicles dwindled quickly. Nicole held her breath, and in a flash the car passed. She looked at the girls. Hopefully, nobody will want to make contact. Here and there, abandoned vehicles, like carcasses of the dying society, littered the roadside. They passed a tent city that dotted a field near a small creek, and they were not tempted to stop. As night neared, they sought a place to camp. The road wandered through farmland and an occasional house and barn. There were no signs of life, human or animal. After rounding a curve on a downhill grade, Nicole slipped the transmission into neutral to save fuel. Up ahead, built close to the road and surrounded by open fields, a farmhouse stood silently. A large oak tree shaded its southern exposure, and a tire swing dangled from one of its limbs. A cozy porch spanned the front of the house. Nicole conjured an image of a young family. Two small children played near the swing, and their mother stood on the porch, waving a towel and calling their names. Behind the house, a dust cloud followed her husband's tractor. Nicole sighed a sadness. Shemaine sat up and pointed. Why don't we stop there? She paused. It looks quiet enough. Maybe there's something we could use. Nicole depressed the brake softly. We'll slow down and take a look. Don't get out of the truck if I stop. The truck slowed, its engine rumbling at an idle speed. The girls fidgeted. A gravel driveway extended to the side of the house. Nicole shifted the truck back into gear and eased it up the driveway. The house was a simple two-story, peaked roof dwelling, painted sunny yellow with white trim. Broken windows on the porch allowed curtains to flutter a welcome in a warm breeze. The front door stood open. Nicole held the transmission lever tightly, anticipating a quick shift into reverse. They were almost to the side of the house, no more than thirty feet from the porch. Nicole hit the brakes hard, shifted into reverse, looked over her right shoulder and depressed the accelerator sharply. The truck spun a bit of gravel and moved backward. Julia screamed, Stop! Nicole hit the brakes. What? What? Julia pointed. Mom, that's a playpen on the porch. Nicole stared. Oh, God. Oh, God. Her eyes shifted back to the grass near the house where corpses were lying. A man, a woman, and one large yellow dog. All three had dark circular stains in the area of their chest. There had been madness here. Nicole wiped the sweat from her brow and ran the same hand down her jeans. Maybe a baby. She shifted the truck into park. Shemaine, hand me the pistol, and when I get out, you get behind the wheel. Wide-eyed, Shemaine whispered as Nicole carefully stepped out of the truck. You're going in there? She handed her mother the pistol and slid behind the wheel. The faster I do this, the better. The pistol, a forty-four, hung at Nicole's side. She turned to the girls. Leave the truck door open. She took a few steps and turned again. I'll have to look through the entire house. She turned back to the house and walked hurriedly to the porch steps and up to the playpen. It's empty. Nicole looked through the open door and listened. A cricket fiddled from somewhere under the porch. Other than that, it was quiet. Carpeted stairs led up into darkness, and a hallway led to a kitchen. There, an open door showed part of the backyard. Nicole took a breath and stepped into the house. She looked to her left and flinched at the sight of another body lying on the floor of a small bedroom, another adult. Nicole moved quickly to the kitchen. A startled chicken escaped out the back door. 
Nicole pointed the gun in the chicken's direction. Scared silly, she sighed. Huh, chicken burgers for lunch, almost. She lowered the gun and went to the back door. The yard area, cloaked in the deep shade of two large oak trees, had only a few tufts of grass. Nicole mumbled. No baby. She turned about sharply. She made a check of the rooms upstairs and dashed out the front door, running to the truck. Shemaine slid over and Nicole slid in. No baby. We're out of here. She backed out of the driveway and headed down the road. We'll drive through the night. We can rest during the day. They took turns behind the wheel, and the night passed slowly. At dawn, Nicole drove, and the girls unfolded a road map. Nicole stopped, and Shemaine sprawled the map out with both hands. Where the hell are we? Julia pointed. Here, here. She moved her finger to another position. We passed that bridge last night. The map indicated an unpopulated area to the east, with only small, unpaved roads apparently wandering aimlessly. Nicole's finger traced one of them to its end. We'll take this road to the end and see if there's a place to camp. She looked at Shemaine. Okay? Then she looked at Julia. Sound okay? Shemaine spoke first. Looks like a long way to go for a one-night stay. Nicole squinted. What we saw yesterday is making me nervous. Perhaps we can find a spot to stay longer. Julia yawned. A place to hide. I'll go for that. She looked at her mother. I'm sure Dad's cousins are in as big a mess as we are. Nicole folded the map. Okay, we have the time. Let's check it out. The girls nodded, and Nicole depressed the accelerator. They found the road and turned east onto its gravel base. On either side of the road the land was uncultivated. It had a wild appearance, semi-desert with low hills to the east, no buildings and no fences. They drove over one hill and to the top of another. Here the gravel gave way to dirt, and the land spread out in a broad plateau. Nicole shifted the truck into four-wheel drive and cruised slowly for another half hour. A small grouping of trees to the north came into view. Nicole spoke as she studied them. I'm going to head for that bunch of trees. The girl said nothing. Nicole turned toward the trees and drove slowly over bumpy land that rose gradually. The trees, about two miles away, seemed small and lonely on the broad plain. However, the need was isolation and water. They found what they wanted. Eleven trees surrounded a small pool fed by a slow-moving creek. The creek came from the high hills to the north and made a sweeping turn before wandering to the west. Nicole jumped out of the truck. Perfect. We'll camp here. Shemaine ran to the pool. It looks plenty deep. She smiled at the others. Plenty deep for a bath. The cove provided security in its remoteness, and the ample water supply satisfied the last of their survival needs. The family set up a campsite with little enthusiasm. <laughs>